Uh, disability is neutral, right? And so it's not inherently, you know, a problem, but it, it, it very much can be a problem depending on the context and the circumstances. But in the diversity model, you know, people kind of tend to not only just kind of acknowledge disability, but start to own it and start to embrace it. And so, um, but really you started to see a different perspective, which was people were talking for the first time about disability pride and rejecting, you know, that disability shame that had been for so long. That was Dr. Aaron Andrews on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists committed to cutting-edge, integrative, and evidence-based strategies for living well. On this podcast, we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. I am Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. We hope this podcast offers you ideas for how to live a full and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Hi, this is Debbie. Today, I'm bringing you an interview with Dr. Erin Andrews, who is a psychologist, and she's here with us for this interview because she is also a very strong voice for disability, for disability rights, awareness of disability, and disability culture. And she's widely published in this area, and you'll hear um, she has some really just thought-provoking and like pretty cool ideas about this. Uh, What did you think about the episode? I was just blown away by it, Debbie. First, it was really nice to hear about your work uh, at the VA, what you're doing. And I really want to thank you for bringing Dr. Andrews on. I think that uh, she's an example of how when compassion gets into the drive system, it is pretty phenomenal what can be done with it. And I was moved by what she's doing in the field, as well as just personally looking at my own life and areas where I can definitely have some room for improvement in terms of being an advocate for people with disability uh, in my own, in my children and, and in my personal life. So I just thank you for opening up my eyes to some things that I haven't been paying as much attention to, but I, I value. Well, I'm glad you think so. I think so too. I've learned a lot from her work and from working with people with disabilities. And so I hope that other people find this episode interesting and useful as well. Dr. Erin Andrews is a clinical associate professor at Dell Medical School and supervisory psychologist and the co-director of psychology training at the Central Texas Veterans Healthcare System. She is a board-certified rehab psychologist with her doctorate from Wright State University and Bachelor of Science from Michigan State University. Dr. Andrews has had numerous publications and professional lectures on disability topics related to her areas of research interest in disability culture, identity, and inclusion. She is the past co-chair of the APA Committee on Disability Issues in Psychology and chair, chair of the Division 22 Disability Identity Committee from its inception until 2018. Dr. Andrews has completed innovative work to address the needs of parents with disabilities. She is the co-founder of the Disabled Parenting Project, DPP, a resource for support and information for parents and prospective parents with a wide range of disabilities. Her advocacy work in this area includes representing the American Psychological Association during a 2013 congressional briefing regarding parents with disabilities and participating in a White House forum on the civil rights of parents with disabilities in May 2016. Dr. Andrews has received numerous awards for her work, most recently an APA Citizen Psychologist Presidential Citation in 2018. Congratulations, Erin. That's amazing. Thank you. And Erin, you have a book coming up, I understand, called Disability as Diversity, Developing Cultural Competence, and that's coming out later this year. Is that about right? Yes, that should be right. It's in production with Oxford University Press, and I'm hopeful, fingers crossed, uh, that we'll have it out uh, maybe uh, October or November of 2019. 
Well, it'll be a wonderful contribution to the field. And you showed me your table of contents. And I think we're going to cover some of the topics today, but I'm sure the book goes much more into depth. So for those listeners who are interested in this, I'd really recommend, uh, we'll link to your book when it comes out, I'd recommend taking a look at the book so that, that you can take a deeper dive into these topics. Sounds great. Yeah. So Aaron, we both met, we're both VA psychologists and we met a few years back through VA circles. Um, it's really mm-hmm. nice to cross paths again. Um, yes. To start, I wanted to just um, note, so you're clearly a psychologist who's really been published in rehab psychology and a really strong voice for disability rights within psychology um, and outside of psychology. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about why this issue is so important to you, both professionally and personally? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, when I went into clinical psychology as a career, you know, when I started graduate school, uh, it was always with the intention uh, of understanding uh, people with disabilities and, and getting the opportunity to work with other disabled people. Um, I am disabled myself. I was born with a congenital disability um, that uh means I'm a triple amputee. I have no legs at all. Um, I have the congenital hip disarticulation, which means amputation through both my hips. And then uh, I have a left above elbow amputation. So uh, my my kids refer to me as, you know, my mommy has no legs and one arm. And that's pretty accurate. That's pretty much uh, the, the situation. And so I've always uh, wanted to uh, study more about disability. I knew from, uh, you know, my formative years that the experience of living as a person with a disability, uh, is a profound experience. It's something that really affects, uh, every aspect of you. And so when I decided to go on to graduate school, I kept that in mind. I chose my graduate program based on that. I chose my career specialization in rehab psychology based on that. And so it's uh, it's both professional and personal to me. Well, it's a wonderful example of how the professional and the personal are tied together because you've taken your personal experience and really used it, I think, to be a strong voice and to to help other people navigate, um, you know, in this area. So for me, I'm not I'm not personally disabled, but I my I have several jobs. My main job is as a psychologist in, in the VA and spinal cord injuries. And I work with folks with spinal cord injuries, MS and ALS. And so a vast majority of my clients in my VA job are um, people who have either physical or cognitive disabilities. So to me, it's it's very professionally important. And then, you know, personal people that I know in my personal life as well. Um, and just in general, I think for our listeners, I, I'm imagining that pretty much probably everyone who's listening either has a disability themselves or know someone with a disability personally or professionally. Um, dis- I was reading in some of your literature, Erin, that dis- disabled people are one of the largest minority groups in the U.S. An estimated 56.7 million people in the U.S. live with some type of disability. And that that 45% of the people in the U.S. have a chronic health condition that involves some sort of physical disability. Right. And it really kind of starts to, you know, question minority. We're not, a, we're not a minor, we're hardly a minority. And at one point, we're not going to be a minority. I mean, it's, it's so prevalent that, you know, what you just mentioned about, you know, nearly half of the population deals with some sort of chronic medical condition. And so it's definitely not, not a minority numbers wise. Well, one thing I think is really interesting, and I know you've you've been really um, speaking up about this, especially, is in our field of psychology. We care, I'd say, as a whole, as a field, about diversity issues, and we kind of, you know, make a point of it. But it really, it seems to me that disability is sort of overlooked a lot. And I'm, I'm just thinking about some of the professional groups and organizations I'm in and the training I've had. We talk so much about race and gender and, you know, sexual orientation and all these types of diversity. And yet, to me, I feel like we don't talk about disability as often or as much as we should. What are your thoughts about that, Erin? Well, as you might imagine, I have a lot of thoughts about that. And and I agree with you. I mean, you're right. We, We don't hear about disability in the same way that we sometimes hear about other areas of diversity. And to be clear, 
Uh, this isn't a competition and in no way would I ever suggest we uh, think less about race and think less about sexual orientation or other types of diversity variables because they are so, so crucial. And importantly, many people with disabilities also uh, you know, identify other areas of diversity as part of their selves. So um, people of color who are disabled, disabled women. Um, so we, I think we've really, we've got to take this conversation in psychology around diversity. We, we've got to take it into the realm of intersectionality and really start thinking about the multiple ways in which people are impacted by different identities. Um, but we have seen that psychology, you know, and I've been very, I think, very frank about this over a long time, even in my work within APA, I was previously the chair of the Committee on Disability Issues. Um, and so what, what we see is that disability is just not at the table so much of the time. So, uh, for example, I've written a couple of articles where I've done research looking at psychology training. And while we see other uh, identities uh, starting to improve some of their kind of marginalized status, you know, students of color, um, students who identify as LGBT, uh, you know, their numbers in psychology in terms of representation are climbing. Now they're so low, they still need a lot of work. But the problem is, is that when we look at disability representation, I have this graph in one of my uh, journal articles, and it's just like a slump. Like we peaked in the 1980s and then kind of just slumped off, you know, since then, which is, is terrible. It's the complete wrong direction. It's not what we're seeing in terms of all of these other marginalized groups. And so I think that really speaks to what we see in the broader field. If we're not able to um, mentor and recruit and retain you know, students with disabilities in psychology, then they're not going to become disabled psychologists. And so we just aren't, um, we aren't seeing the representation that we probably need to see. And so there's a lot of barriers for, for people with disabilities to, to break into the field. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, biases and assumptions. Uh, and, and that's particularly frustrating when we're an organization or a field that really kind of prides itself on you know, awareness of biases and, and all of those kinds of things. So it, it remains a huge problem. And that's actually part of why some of my uh, recent article, I know that we're going to be talking about like the Say the Word article, uh, was in, in response to some of the, uh, the negligence that we've seen from the profession. Right. And I think that's, to me, that's part of what's sad about it is that as a field, I feel like we should do better. We could do better, you know, representation within the field and yeah, bringing these issues to the forefront. Well, I think we have to do better because we just talked about these numbers and, you know, people with disabilities are a huge uh, group of, of people. And I think if we, if we don't do better, we're going to miss the boat. And psychology is in a, a place right now where you know, we have to make our relevance clear. And there's there's master's level mental health providers, there's there's other kind of uh, professions and, and folks that are willing to fill these gaps if we don't fill them ourselves. Right, right. All right, so you mentioned the that Say the Word article that just came out, and it's a wonderful article. I'm, we'll link to it on our show notes for this episode. I'd really encourage people to take a look at it. So this article is a disability culture commentary on the racer of disability. And it's kind of become a social media call to embrace disability identity. Um, and in the article, you tell a really interesting story about how this, the original seeds for this article kind of came about at an APA convention. So it's a group of, you know, it's a big conference for psychologists can you tell that story? Because I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, over the years working, you know, volunteering in terms of leadership and governance roles in APA, uh, I'm pretty aware of the, the history of disability in the organization. And one of the biggest uh, issues that comes up uh, is just having this APA convention, which is just, it's a gigantic conference. It's truly a convention, uh, more so than a conference. There's multiple hotels and there's, you know, this whole, uh, you know, whole matrix of places to be and things to do. 
And as you can imagine, for people, psychologists with disabilities and students with disabilities, it's, it, it can pose a lot of challenges. Well, one thing that we have always had is this disability resource room. Uh, and I say always, meaning during my tenure, um, you know, and for the past, you know, 20 years or so, we've had this disability resource room. And that's a place where uh, it, it, it's in kind of a main convention hall area where the vendors are and things like that. And there's screen readers uh, for, um, you know, blind attendees. There's um, That's where you can go and get an ASL uh, translator if you're deaf. That's where you can go and, uh, I mean, an ASL interpreter. It, that's where you can go and just rest. You've got a chronic, you know, health condition and you've been trying to book it from session to session, you can rest. Um, but it, it's also been kind of a, you know, a social, a, a place where, you know, we can meet in terms of um, this a very kind of scarce number of people with disabilities in uh, the profession of psychology. It's kind of been our home base uh, to say, per se. Um, and then, so I, I've been off the committee for a few years and you know, I've been trying to raise my family. I haven't been to ATA every year the way I used to. And then I, I hear, I get this email through the Division 22 list they're saying, so they renamed it the Multi-Abled Resource Room. And I was like, what? What does that mean, Multi-Abled? What is that word? I've never heard that word, Multi-Abled, like what? And multiple abilities? Who has multiple abilities? And then why do they need a resource room? It was very confusing to me, and um, immediately I reached out to other colleagues. I think Linda Mona, a friend of mine over at the Long Beach VA, is like, "Erin, what is going on? Do you know anything about this?" And and uh, and I say no, and I call Carrie Polarski. She's the former uh, CDIP chair as well up at the University of Michigan, and she's baffled. And and anyway, so we we kind of came together and we asked APA like. What, what's up with this? Why did you change the name of the resource room? And so the feedback we got was something along the lines of people aren't using the resource room because they're saying that they don't want to be identified as disabled. And we thought, wow. I mean, I thought, wow, wow. So here we have this organization where disabled people are underrepresented and there's supposed to be this resource to help them to, you know, be able to fully participate. And shame is keeping people from ac accessing those resources. Um, so, you know, it just, it really struck a chord in me that in 2019, you know, um, almost 30 years after the ADA had passed, um, Shame is what's getting in the way of, of people using the resources that are available to them. And so I, you know, but I was frustrated with APA because I, I felt like to, to remove the word disabled and to replace it with this really, what I would consider to be a ridiculous and silly euphemism. And there's a history of silly euphemism when it comes to disability. Uh, I just thought, you know, we're being complicit and, and it's wrong. And I, I, I felt very, very strongly that APA was taking the wrong stance here and the wrong move and taking that uh, feedback and trying to just kind of say, oh, well, we won't call it the disability resource room. And then, you know, people will feel okay about it. But historically, you know, that's been, that's been something that's been done. And that's why the title of the, the article talks about erasure, because, you know, disability to us is not just a word and in, in disability community and disability culture it's not just a word it's an identity it's a part of our identity and so when you try to kind of take that out or erase that uh, it's very threatening and so I think it, it was a very threatening situation and so we thought it was important my colleagues and I thought it was really important to to act and so part of what we did was in writing the article was uh, therapeutic, you know, to just kind of get out the frustration and, and the upset. And, um, you know, it turned out at the same time, uh, Don Eady, who's the, the, um, editor for Rehab Psych was like, write me an editorial. And so we took our initial response and we, uh, we formulated the say the word, uh, commentary. And it was just really this objection to taking that word disability and trying to make it go away, 
trying to, uh, you know, what we view as, as sugarcoat things to, you know, make people feel more comfortable. Yeah, I think language is important in terms of identity. And one thing that, that you kind of write about it is that this is partly an identity thing. It's also almost, it's a part of your experience. And by trying to kind of erase it or get rid of it, it sort of minimizes that. And I think, you you know, you mentioned that there are a lot of different silly ways that people talk about disability. You mentioned a few in your article, you know, handy capable, these kinds of things that you sometimes hear. I think it's people who are to some degree, maybe well-intentioned. They're trying to be sort of politically correct or something like that. And yet really there's, there's something I think in terms of s- stigma, um, what's, what are your, what's your response to words like that when you hear them? Yeah, it's just an icky kind of response. I mean, words like that are are silly and they're they're patronizing you know they're they're words that that are typically made up by non-disabled people which is your first clue (laughs) um you know words that describe people they should be owned uh and developed by the people who actually own that identity so these are usually made up by non-disabled people oftentimes like you say i would say all of the time well-intentioned people People who are trying to say, oh, well, you know, you still have strengths as, as, you know, people with disabilities still have a lot to offer. I mean, those are good sentiments. But the problem with those kinds of euphemisms is, is this kind of sugar coating, you know, and it, 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 it's not very accurate and it doesn't, um, it doesn't allow people to kind of own an identity. I mean, if you think, if you don't think that there's anything wrong with an identity as a disabled person, you don't have any reason to try to sugarcoat that word. You don't have any reason to try to substitute a different word. But, you know, what we see, and at one that's much more common than any of the ones that we even have just talked about, is is the idea of like special education. Everybody uses that term. I mean, it's, it's a field of special education. Um, and in the disability, you know, culture community, I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't like that word. We don't care for that, right? Because we don't think of it as special education. We think about it as education. We think that students with disabilities deserve equal education, equal opportunities, just like other students. But, you know, it's something about, the, you know, calling it special makes it feel better to people outside, you know, people who aren't disabled. And so um, we're, we really want to kind of challenge that and, and encourage people to to use the word disability, because if I'm a child and I go to special education and I'm being told all of my life I'm special and differently abled, I mean, frankly, I don't know what the hell I am, but I sure don't think that I'm somebody that has a disability and I'm not understanding that there's other people out there with disabilities that I can join with in solidarity and that are going to support me. And I know nothing about this whole disability culture and community that, you know, hopefully eventually I'm going to find. Um, but that's really what the problem is, is that we, we kind of try to sugarcoat realities with these, these silly words. And it doesn't help, um, particularly young people, or I think as we'll talk about later on, you know, newly uh, disabled people would kind of have any chance at forming an identity. Right, right. Well, you mentioned finding some of these kind of ways of talking patronizing. And I know another thing you've written about that can feel that way, understandably, is called inspiration porn. Tell us about that, because to me, that's something that I think I I see that sometimes in sort of the popular media. And given my work with spinal cord injury, I'm kind of like, oh, no, <laughs> what is that? So inspiration porn is a very, uh, people hear that and they're like, what are you talking about, porn? And people with disabilities? <laughs> um, but inspiration porn, I mean, think about so we got to break that down a little bit. Inspiration is this whole idea of uh, there's this term inspiring or inspiration that we hear in the disability community all the time. People say that to you when you're disabled. You're such an inspiration. I'm so inspired by you. Uh, And that can be for any reason. It can be because you did something, you know, you achieved something, virtually anything, um, and there's some problems with that, right? Because what that reveals is that 
when anything virtually that someone with a disability does is inspiring, it kind of reveals the bias, right? That we, the expectations for people with disabilities are very, very low. And so when a disabled person does something um, like get a degree or, you know, sometimes go out to the grocery store on a Saturday, um, when that inspires non-disabled people, um, it tells us more about what they think of, of people with disabilities, you know, in general. And so the disability community has really rejected that term and just gets very annoyed, I think, generally by that term. But the, the porn aspect comes in because when we think about porn, that's where we, uh, there's gratification um, that comes from objectification of somebody else or someone else. Right. And so when we talk about inspiration porn, um, what we're looking at is where there's kind of non-disabled gratification and then objectification of someone or someone with disabilities. And so you do see this in the popular culture all the time, especially on social media. So so an example that you might see of a inspiration porn meme on social media, there's one I can think of that uh, depicts a little girl with bilateral upper extremity amputations, uh, writing with a pencil kind of between her thumb. And then it says on the meme, there's usually some phrase or some sort of uh, caption, and it says, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. Uh, and so it's just, with inspiration porn, because it's, it's not about her, it's got nothing to do with this little girl with a disability. It's, it's for the gratification of people, uh, non-disabled people. And so when someone looks at that, I guess they're supposed to feel like amazed and inspired that, you know, this little girl can ride even though she doesn't have any hands and it's supposed to make them feel like they can do anything. Um, and so there's, there's just countless examples of these, but, uh, they're really problematic, um, partly because they're ridiculous. I mean, um, I don't know the little girl in the picture, and I don't know if her parents gave permission for her picture to be used in that way, but I can guess they probably didn't. Um, but from what I do know, um, the likelihood is that she was born, uh, like me, with um, a congenital um, limb deficiency, and so she's probably been writing that way her whole life. And for her, writing with her two stumps is no harder than you or I writing with our fingers. And so, you know, it, it just, it, it takes, her normality and and just um, makes it into something you know really extreme and and it's not it's not for her and it's not about her it's for uh, non disabled people to to feel better and to feel good and that's uh, that's what we call inspiration form. Well, I think it trickles down in another interesting way. So I work with people with. Um, you know, mostly veterans who acquired a disability later in life. So spinal cord injuries after, for example, an accident or something like that. And what I, where I see that trickling down is that sometimes they, they almost take it as a, well, if I think positive enough, if I work hard enough, I'll gain back, you know, whatever I've lost because of my injury, whatever mobility. So I'll be able to walk again or something like that. Yeah. And I think what's so hard about that is that physically it might be that that's not the case. And yet that gives them the message that they should be able to through, you know, a hard work and a positive attitude. Um, you know, and I don't try to be the person out there squashing hopes and dreams. That's not my role. But I also feel like, you know, that's, that's, that's a unfortunate that people are kind of in that position. Then they have a no whole nother source of shame related to, oh, well, I should have been able to sort of overcome this or something. Yeah, and that's a great point. And that is exactly how that hits people with disabilities pretty much universally. It 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 kind of sets up this narrative that it's on the person with a disability to quote unquote overcome their disability, you know, which is ridiculous. And there's a, a really good quote um, by the late and great disability activist, uh, Stella Young, who was an Australian, and she has this amazing TED Talk. If anyone ever just wants to Google Stella Young TED Talk, you will not regret it. But one of her, I think, best quotes ever was, no amount of smiling has ever turned a flight of stairs into a ramp. Hmm. So, right. you know, I mean, that's the thing, is right? So, so many of the barriers that we face are environmental and attitudinal, and, and those are not things that 
you know, a positive attitude is going to fix. And so, but, but the cultural onus is on the individual, you know, you just need to cope better with your disability or you, you know, you just need to smile, (laughs) you know, like as if those things are going to change a a reality, a systemic reality that is much larger than any one disabled person. Yeah. You know, earlier you were talking about um, stigma, and I think for those veterans I work with who, you know, again, usually got their disability later in life, they may not have the same connection to disability culture or the disability rights community that you have because they're, you know, they they didn't have access to that or any, you know, connection to it prior when they were able-bodied. And so what I see in my practice a lot, Erin, is that for people, it can be the stigma that they've been carrying around related to disability that turns into self-stigma, um, shame. I work with a lot of men in the VA, and often I think it, for them it can be tied to is- issues related to masculinity um, connected to their body. Um, what, what thoughts do you have about that? And, and any, I don't know, advice for working with, with folks like that? Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, professionally, I work with a lot of folks that as well. And in fact, you know, it's much more common for somebody to acquire a disability. You know, that's the more, more common route. Um, and, and they don't have access or connection to the disability community in, in the way that people who are living with disability for longer have. And so um, you can't, you can't expect, I mean, you wouldn't expect them to have any awareness or knowledge uh, or socialization to disability culture. Um, And the thing is, is that it it also, you know, what do we do as psychologists, right? We work with the individual and the family and, and, and I, I know the kind of great work that you do. And I think that that is, such important work, right? Like, you're not gonna be in there discouraging somebody saying, well, look, dude, you're never gonna walk again. No, that's not our role. Um, But you are going to be there to support them, um, and kind of help them navigate as they discover, you know, their new realities. But again, I think the the society, our society wants to put the onus on that person with a disability to cope and figure it out. And, um, you know, rearrange their values, you know, do all of the hard work. And yeah, that work's got to be done. But the problem with this whole thing is that if our society continues on the way that we are, it's really not going to get any better. So if if people who acquire disabilities, you know, they're, they're living in this world that reinforces all of those horrible stigmatizing ideas about disability. They didn't come up with that on their own, right? So everything about American culture says um, masculinity and manhood have to do with strength, right? Um, There's no room in our culture for a different narrative, you know, that maybe says that um, masculinity can take on many forms and that, um, you know, Strength isn't the only important uh, thing about being a man or the only, you know, good quality that a man can have. Um, and so I think it, it frustrates me oftentimes because I feel like these people are just put into a trap. It's like they're socialized to learn how awful disability is and then they acquire a disability and it's like, okay, come on, get over it, <laughs> right? So I think it, it that is really, really challenging work. And, you know, I, I hope that um, as, uh, as disability culture and the disability community gets more vocal, I mean, even interviews like this are, are, are an important piece of getting, uh, getting the word out there that, you know, disability is not this, this tragedy or this, you know, horrible, uh, you know, thing that everyone, you know, kind of has been socialized to believe. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some really difficult uh, things about having a disability. There are, um, some, and, and that's in a lot of ways what makes disability a little bit different than other identities. But um, I, I do hope that overall things will change, but I just don't think that we can put all that onus on the individual um, to make those shifts when society just kind of keeps on keeping on with, with attitudes. 
Yeah. So clearly the culture shift is important. I'm always struck by the research about how people sort of overestimate how just difficult and awful it would be. Um, So there's even research about um, medical providers working in a rehab setting and how they think, oh, that must be so awful. You must be so depressed. And yet from the perspective of the person going through it, they're often you know, more resilient. They're not as depressed as people might think. And so I think there's a lot of assumptions going into it. Um, And I think that's maybe a big thing to take a look at is for people to, to check their assumptions to, you know, to do what we can to change the attitudes in general. And then helping people, like you said, you know, a smile is not going to help if you need a ramp, (laughs) just helping people access things and to, to kind of look at it at that level is huge. And then also the community you mentioned earlier, that people sometimes just need to be around other people that have had a similar experience. And I think connecting people to the disability culture to other folks that have maybe had a shared experience can be a really great source of support. Yeah, I totally agree with all of those things. And I, I really cannot underemphasize enough what you said about the medical providers. I think, I mean, in, in medical settings, the the responsibility is is that much greater, um, and we see that not just in in rehab um, scenarios, but you know, think about a, a, a parent. I mean, think about a parent who has a child who's born with a disability, and um, you know, I'll bet those those. Uh, physicians and specialists and all those folks are experts, right, in the kind of natal health area. Um, But they're the ones making predictions to mom and dad about whether or not this child's going to have a good quality of life. And my concern is that oftentimes those folks are spouting off things that maybe they learned in a textbook maybe 20 years ago. I mean, how many people with that disability grown to adulthood did they actually know? I mean, what what is the the accuracy of the information that they're giving um, to the parents? I, I think that you could make a pretty solid argument that it's not always uh, based in uh, reality and, and it tends to be very dire. And then you've set up an entire expectation for a life, um, starting with the parents, that uh, this child is going to suffer and that it's going to be difficult. And we really, we know from psychology about what what are the power, what's the power of expectations? It's, it's pretty, pretty powerful. So, you know, I think that those are the areas where, you know, my hope in my career is that I'm going to be able to help make some, some inroads. And that's why every opportunity I get to talk to a group of physicians, do a grand rounds at a medical school, anything like that, I will jump on because I think if I can change uh, those attitudes even a little bit that that has great potential to influence people's lives positively. Well, that's great. I'm happy you're out there doing this work. I, I think a related thing and something I've I found really has has changed my thoughts as you know a rehab psychologist are the models of disability. I'd I'd love to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, I first encountered this in a book. Um, called What Psychotherapists Should Know About Disability. Um, And I know that this is something you've written about and you're going to cover in your upcoming book. Um, It just really shifted how I think about disability. Um, Erin, are you willing to kind of run us through these different models of disability? Yeah, totally. And I'll tell you, I want to tell you a little bit of an anecdote too about you just mentioned uh, Rhoda Olkin's book from 1999. Um, what psychotherapists should know about disability. And uh, I think that remains an amazing uh, classic. And I remember when that book came out, I was in college, um, I was an undergraduate at Michigan State. And that book, along with another book called No Pity by Joseph Shapiro, those books really changed my life and changed the path of my life. You know, for me to read those books and hear, number one, about kind of the history of our people, the history of disabled people in this country, and number two, about how much attitudes and social factors, uh, you know, kind of play a role in the experience of disability. I mean, that just completely changed my path. And that's what really inspired me to, um, you know, decide to pursue a, a career as a psychologist. And so what Olkin did really well in that book 
well, she did so many things so well in that book. But that that chapter that she writes about the models, disability models, is really, really good. And I think really kind of opened people's eyes up to understanding that there are different ways of, of looking at disability. Um, so she talks about kind of the moral model, and that's the the oldest model. Um, and But it's still prevalent today in certain ways. So the moral model is the idea that disability is somehow associated with morality uh, or virtue. So um, sometimes we see that with, um, I'm sure you've seen this in your practice, Debbie, where somebody acquires a disability and they feel like they're to blame for it. Maybe, you know, maybe if I'd led a cleaner life or, you know, those kinds of things. And so that's that kind of moral model mentality. The medical model is um, really more looking at disability as a medical problem. So the disability is still seen as a problem that kind of resides within the individual. And then, um, but with the medical model is, okay, you know, you're not really to blame for that per se. Let's just kind of tackle the medical piece. Let's just try to fix you, right, from a physical or medical or um, sometimes even rehabilitation perspective. And I think that and, that fix you piece is key that, yeah, yeah, this is a medical problem to be fixed um, and and that it's on you to adjust to this mm-hmm. kind of, right? Yeah. So the medical is fix, fix, fix. The rehab is kind of adjust, adjust, adjust. And uh, again, that, that where's the onus? The onus is on the disabled person and it's kind of all about them and their problems. It's, it really is ignoring um, the, the problems in the environment, the broader environment. And then, you know, starting in about the 1960s and then kind of at the height of the 1980s, the social model came out. And that, that was a super important model, um, a turning point for, I would say, disability studies in general, um, to where people started to kind of push back and say, well, you know, th- this medical problem or this this whatever, you know, um, disability is going on, you know, it really wouldn't even be that much of a disability if, uh, for example, the, um, the environment was different. And a great example of that is deaf people. I mean, deaf people really don't have any disability um, when they're among other people who are fluent in ASL because linguistically, um, you know, they, they, there's nothing really that they can't do. It's just that in the broader society, um, when people are not fluent in ASL, then you start to uh, run into barriers. So that's kind of, I guess, the classic example of the, the social model. Um, and one area in psychology that was super important, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is there was a psychologist named Beatrice Wright, and she um, she's kind of considered, the like I would call her the founding mother of rehabilitation psychology. And she was really the first one to take these concepts that stemmed from Kurt Levine's uh, field theory, um, you know, and and say, yeah, I mean, this makes sense. And and it applies really specifically to disability that, um, you know, the environment is is really, really important, and particularly the social environment, the attitudes of other people. She was one of the first ones to really talk um, specifically about um, stigma uh, you know, in disability in particular. And so that was a huge turning point. But then in the 90s, I think um, people started to make the link that, you know, there's other there's other groups of people, uh, you know, uh, that are marginalized, whether they be ethnic or racial minorities or um, LGBT identified folks or whatnot, um, that were kind of having a a parallel struggle. And so that's when Oaken calls it the minority model. In my book, I call it the diversity model, and it's pretty much the same thing. And basically, the idea of the diversity model is that uh, disability is neutral, right? And so it's not inherently, um, you know, a problem, um, but it, it, it very much can be a problem depending on the context and the circumstances. But in the diversity model, you know, people kind of uh, tend to not only just kind of acknowledge disability, but start to own it and start to embrace it. And so, you know, we saw a lot of inspiration from the civil rights movements and, you know, the 1960s, 
Um, and the disability rights movement in the 1980s was in its heyday, and it kind of had culminated in the, the passing of, of ADA in 1990. Um, but really, you started to see a different, a different um, perspective, which was people were talking for the first time about disability pride and rejecting, you know, that disability shame that had been for so long really pushed um, upon people with disabilities. So it's less about there being something wrong with the person that needs to be fixed and more about how our culture is is accepting or not accepting and and working toward, you know, accessibility and acceptance and whatnot. Yeah, you know, that has a lot to do with it. And it also, uh, you know, it talks explicitly about, you know, pride in a disabled identity and, and forming a disabled identity. Um, you know, in the social model, it's like, I'm not disabled, the environment is disabling me, right? But uh-huh. in the, the diversity model, the, the difference is, you know, I am disabled and I'm identifying as someone who's disabled and I'm taking pride in that and I'm going to reject I'm going to reject a lot of the norms that society is putting on me. And it's not as simple as what we would see with, you know, let's shift the environment and have ramps and things like that. It's more like, wow, my body doesn't look anything like bodies look like on TV. My body doesn't look anything like what I've been told my whole life is an ideal um, female uh, body and and so as part of a disability model perspective, um, people are rejecting that. They're saying, "Okay, but I don't have to. I don't have to change my body to fit those norms." I could kind of liken it to, for instance, with with feminism, a shift from the belief that, oh well, women need to you know be more assertive and lean in and get high powered jobs and sort of putting the burden of sexism on women changing to fit in more to the male world versus taking a look at it socially as, um, you know, it's not the problem with women and we have an identity and we can sort of be who we are. And, but yeah, yeah. totally, totally. Yeah. So like, right. The, so feminism of thinking, you know, yeah, great. Women can be in high powered positions and they can also be uh, stay at home moms and all of that can be feminist, right? right? And so that's kind of where where we're at, I think, too, in terms of the 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 di- diversity model. I mean, you know, great, there's Paralympians who are out there achieving wonderful things, you know, awesome, that's great. But, you know, most people with disabilities aren't going to go, you know, do some sort of um, competitive sports. And, and that's, that's also okay, too. It doesn't right. have to be um, what we we would call the the Paralympian mentality is kind of like the super clip. And you see that a lot in rehab, right? Like there's this one poster. I don't know if you guys have it in your your area, but um, I've seen it at so many different places. It's like this guy with a spinal cord injury um, in his manual wheelchair. He's literally mountain climbing. I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, I've seen some of those. Yeah. Mountain climbing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like you too, you know, nothing can stop you. And, um, but you know, the diversity model is like, Hey, you know what? That's okay. I'm not, I don't go, I don't have to go be a Paralympian. I, right. um, you know, I have muscles that, uh, you know, are, are weakening and, and gradually weakening and I'm never going to climb a mountain and I'm okay with that body. And that's fact, okay. <laughs> I love that body. Yeah. 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 So I know a lot of your advocacy work has been for parents who have a disability and that that's part of your personal experience. And also that's a group that, that tends to be overlooked. What are some of the concerns that you think need to be addressed there in terms of advocacy? Well, there's a lot kind of remains to be done. Um, You know, when we started the disabled parenting project, we had a couple of objectives in mind. One was, and kind of foremost was, to provide an opportunity for parents with disabilities to get support and guidance from other parents with disabilities, the people that we feel are really the most qualified to to give that support and advice. Um, You know, uh, it's great. We've got wonderful medical experts out there um, that have an important role to play. But again, 
you know, how many genetic counselors uh, or, or medical doctors who are going to tell you all about the genetic testing for spinal muscular atrophy have actually ever talked to an adult with SMA, you know, I mean, and that, that's the thing. So uh, we really uh, wanted to provide an opportunity for parents to connect with other parents. Um, and to share tips and, and support and things like that. And so our online uh, presence have, has done that. We have a website, we have a Facebook group, we have um, forums. There's, so there's lots of opportunities for that. Um, the other thing is that we we wanna kind of continue to work to develop uh, resources for professionals. And there's a lot of professionals that are involved in disabled parenting. Obviously there's the medical professionals and we'd like them to do some of the things I've been alluding to, like maybe link, you know, potential parents of disabled children up with, you know, organizations that have adults with those disabilities where there can be some, some mentorship or things like that. But the other thing is that there's a huge kind of uh, legal component to this. And, and people might think legal, like what is it, what does legal have to do with parenting? Well, when you have a disability, it has everything to do with parenting because the, the legal system the child welfare system is disproportionately involved with families uh, of uh, where parents, one or more of the parents have uh, disabilities. And so we have all of these cases where we, we've we heard about or been involved in cases where the child has been removed from the parent's custody uh, in, in all these different instances. And it's, it's, the problem with it is it's based on the fact that the parent has a disability. And so we're not saying every parent with a disability is capable, just like we wouldn't say every parent without a disability is capable. What we're saying is disability itself doesn't make you a capable or not capable parent, that there needs to be a fair and culturally competent assessment of those abilities. But that doesn't really happen. In reality, what happens is assumptions make decisions. So the assumption that the parent with a disability is a lesser parent is going to result in the non-disabled parent being awarded full custody or the assumption that these two blind people who happen to have been taking care of themselves their entire adult lives, you know, are not going to be able to take care of this newborn baby. So social service is going to take it away. And uh, people don't know that that's happening. People just have no awareness that it's happening and how incredibly scary it is for people with disabilities that if we, um, if, if we need help, it's like, don't even ask for help because it's, it's so scary. People are scared that their children will be taken from them and that their parenting abilities and, and skills will be questioned and that they won't have any recourse. And I, I wish I could say to these parents, like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. It won't happen to you. But I mean, that would be, that would be irresponsible because it is. It happens to people and there are laws in many states today that say, I think we still have like 26, 20 something states still have laws on the books that say that disability itself is, you know, a reason that you can um, consider removing the child or deeming the parent to be unfit. Disability alone, without any, um, without any actual assessment. So that's what we're really focusing on is, is trying to make people aware of this issue and speak up and, and get involved in legislation that's going to provide uh, parents, you know, with more resources so that they don't have to be so afraid that their kids are going to get taken away. I had no idea. That's really sad and scary. Yeah. I appreciate you spreading the word um, and the work that you're doing to help with that. Um, and what about talking with children about, about disability? On this podcast, we often ask, you know, our our guests for pointers on 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 working with kids and for parents. Um, and in my experience, I think that sometimes parents, able-bodied parents get embarrassed or they're not quite sure how to talk to their children about disability in a non-stigmatizing way. So for instance, if a child sees someone who is using a wheelchair and they ask a question or something like that, the parents sometimes act so like, I don't know, weird about it, I think out of their own embarrassment. What, how do you recommend that parents approach these kind of um, topics related to disability with their children? 
It's funny that you mentioned that because this is this is an ongoing, I think, uh, issue that comes up, and it's actually something I've been thinking about, uh, thinking about maybe maybe writing something up about just a little bit more in depth than than what kind of the usual conversation is or the usual response. Because um, I, I think it's uh, I think it's a really important issue, and I think um, you know what you're nailing right off the bat is that you know by the parent, you know, getting really uncomfortable and trying to kind of shush the child, um, you know, it's kind of setting setting up a problematic dynamic, right? So if, you know, this happens to me all the time because my disability is super visible. I mean, I have, my body's asymmetrical. I'm really noticeable. I use a power wheelchair. It's like, there, you know, I might as well have a target right on my head um for um for children and so you know they see me and they've never seen anyone like me and they're curious and that's really natural you know and so what we always tell parents you know, those of us in the disability community you know we we tell parents like hey you know don't don't try to shush your child don't try to shame your child for talking to or or asking questions about disability um you know let them let them talk and um you know, I don't think that means you have to put all the onus on the disabled person to like handle the situation, but you can model, you know, model some some good social skills like, hey, why don't you say hello, you know, or introduce yourself. And and what that's going to do is it's going to normalize for kids, um, you know, that people with disabilities are people and, you know, you can go up and say hi. And if, if we shush them and tell them it's rude to point and it's rude to stare, uh, they get in their minds that the disability is shameful and it's not to be talked about and that people with disabilities are to be avoided. So, you know, that's kind of my, my typical response, but I also think that there's, there's more to unpack here. And like I said, I'm, that's kind of one of my, uh, on my to do, my very long <laughs> project list of, uh, things that I'd like to write up. But I mean, I guess what I would do is like, I would encourage parents too to think about, think about the diversity model, right? Like, so um, if that's, if you're a white, you know, woman with a white child and you're out in the community and your child is, is pointing and uh, making a big deal over somebody who's black, they've never seen a black person before. Well, that tells you something about your community and it tells you something about your life and who you're friends with and who you bring into your home. And I think that that's also a fair conversation to have about disability. So um, I understand that, you know, disabilities are different and, you know, you could go through your whole life and never, never run across somebody like me. But if you, if you do have other people in your life that look different or other people in your life that, you know, maybe use a assistive device or something like that, your kid is going to be a lot less freaked out by somebody um, who is that different. So um, part of what I wanna do is just encourage parents to think about, you know, a little bit more inclusively about your life. And and it's gonna open up some really hard questions because most non-disabled adults are gonna think, if I ask you if your house is accessible, you're gonna, you're gonna start running through it and you're gonna realize it's probably not because houses aren't accessible. And that's a universal thing. I mean, and that's what people with disabilities face every day. I mean, like if I go to buy a house, like houses aren't made for people like me. And so I can't, you know, take my kid over to a play date at some other parent's house unless there's all of these other kind of instances that are, or situations that are going to mitigate, like my able-bodied spouse can come with me, or um, they happen to have a disabled child. So they happen to have an accessible house. You know, but those really aren't the odds. And so, you know, just being thoughtful and inclusive, like when you're planning your kid's birthday party, like, are you thinking about the, 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 the fact that the place where you hold it might or might not be accessible? Um, if there's other, if there's disabled kids in the school or in the class, like, are they getting invited, you know, to these events? Because we still continue to hear about this type of exclusion and it's well-intentioned exclusion. Like a friend of mine, I, I, I couldn't believe this, even though it, it probably was in some degree well-intentioned, but like my friend who's in a wheelchair, her little daughter was not invited to a birthday party because the birthday party was at their house and the other mom was like so anxious that their house wasn't wheelchair accessible. So my friend and her husband who are both in wheelchairs, 
like like but instead of just talking to them and saying like hey someone says having a birthday party and we're planning to have it at the house and here i'm realizing like our house is totally inaccessible um you know it, it's just like you're not going to get through this and kind of come out on the other side you know better for it and not experience some amount of discomfort so people kind of need to be prepared to do some of that self-examination um, you know, willing to experience some of that, that discomfort um, and, and, and learn, you know, listen and learn. And, and I think we can all be better for it. Yeah. I think it takes your say the word um, hashtag, hashtag say the word to a whole nother level, which is more than just the word. It's kind of how we're thinking about it and how we are or aren't being inclusive. Um, I think there's a great example in Rhoda Olkin's book about um, you know, people might say to her, like, oh, are you coming to this restaurant? Because if so, we'll find an accessible restaurant. <laughs> when in fact, that would be like saying, oh, you know, Black people aren't allowed at this golf course. Would you still go to the golf course? Like, if you truly care about inclusivity, no. You would say that's yeah. enough not to. Um, whereas we may not be thinking about that with disability. Right. And we're not, we're just not. And I think that that's where the ally piece comes in. Like there was this uh, article on social media that recently kind of made the rounds of uh, um, uh, a couple of um, a couple who went to get married, these two men, and they had their wedding outside at like a national park or something. And then the whole article was about how like, they were so shocked and horrified that the, the park wasn't accessible. And their one of their wedding guests like, couldn't come and um and I mean I understand the point was like yeah I mean in 2019 no park should not be accessible I mean sure everything should be accessible I mean the ADA is almost 30 years old but that's not reality and allies know that you know non-disabled allies get it they know that that's not reality and that we still are going to face uh inaccessibility you know every day and and the non-disabled ally isn't going to ask whether or not you're coming first right he's going to just make sure that his, his venue is accessible and he's going to take the ownership of that because for, you know, so long, forever, the ownership's been on the individual person with disabilities and that's, that's exhausting, right? So what we want to do as, as good allies is, is take some of that ownership ourselves so that it doesn't have to be on them. Like, I don't have to say, hey, um, do, you know, is this an okay restaurant for you? I'm going to just go ahead and call and let you know, hey, I checked it out and I made sure they're accessible. We're good to go. You in? Yeah. Right. And if it's not accessible, whether or not you're in, maybe find a different venue, right? Right, right. Well, I have really just been um, so appreciative of all the advocacy work that you've done um, and how much, I, I don't know, I feel like you've made a big difference using your career to do this work, and, and I really appreciate it. I'm wondering if we can kind of wrap up by offering resources or, you know, places people can turn to if they want to learn more or if they want to do some advocacy work. What what recommendations do you have? And we'll be sure to link to any resources you mention on the show notes for today so if people can easily find them. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I think that the reason why people become psychologists is always more complicated than just wanting to do the work. Right. So, I mean, and that's what I think is just beautiful and absolutely wonderful about working with other psychologists. It's like nobody goes through and gets a doctorate in psychology for the fun of it because it's not really that fun. It's pretty traumatic for a lot of times, um, you know, what we go through. Um, and, and you do it because you're, you, of course, you have the, the urge and, and the desire to help people and make the world a better place. And, and you're doing your therapy or your assessment or, you know, whatever it is that you do professionally. But, you know, what I found in my career is that that's, that's not the total package for me. So being, being an advocate is allowing me to use my training and my skills and my professional identity in a way that really kind of fills me up. And so I would encourage people to, you know, consider getting involved in something that they're passionate about. And everybody's passionate about something. I mean, it might be a diversity issue. Like for me, it's disability. Um, but for other people, it, it could be something entirely different. But I think that, you know, getting involved with your community um, in some way and giving back is just so, uh, so worth it. Even though, yeah, it's a lot of time. It's 
time away from your family and it's, you know, on top of your, your day job and all of that. But you can also involve your family too. You know, that's, that's the wonderful thing about advocacy is, you know, I've gotten to, uh, like on both my trips to DC, like I brought my family with me and, you know, what an opportunity, like for my child to know that, you know, I went and participated in a White House briefing or a congressional briefing, you know, that for them to be able to know that I did those things, I think that's, that's really important. Um, but one, I, one initiative that I think is really good if people aren't familiar with, it's the citizen psychologist um, kind of initiative. And that was um, done by former APA president, Jessica Henderson Daniels. And uh, there's a whole uh, there's a whole resource on the APA uh, website about uh, how to become a citizen psychologist. And this is just recognizing the things that psychologists are doing in their communities every day um, that kind of go above and beyond. And so there's a lot of ideas there. You can kind of read about other psychologists, what they've done in their communities, how they've been advocates, and what they've gotten from it. So I think that that's been a really wonderful initiative. And so if you're kind of looking, well, you know, what could I do? I think that's a really great place to start. Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be sure to share that on the show notes. And I encourage people to to take a look at your work and other work. We'll link to some of the APA rehab psych resources and some of your articles, Erin, and um, hope that people will will take this as as a call to to learn more and to do their part. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Erin. It was really nice talking to you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me to be here. It was such a great opportunity to share some of this work. And I, I am so grateful that you invited me to be here to talk to you today. Well, and our listeners, if you could please do your part too to share the episode with, with people who might be interested, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com.